There is an object displayed in a case at the Cairo Museum that shouldn't exist. It is made of stone, yet it looks metallic. It is fragile, yet built with a precision that defies logic. It has three curved blades, a central hub, and a perfectly calibrated hole. They call it the Sabu Disc, and it was carved 5,000 years ago in an era when the wheel had not yet been invented. But that object can't be a bowl, it can't be a lid, and it can't be a decoration. When you closely observe its proportions, its balance, the lightness of the blades, it seems clear that its shape is functional, that it was specifically designed to do something. But what? Today we will go in search of clues that reveal the presence of ancient and advanced knowledge, visible but inexplicably ignored. But before we begin, as always, we invite you to subscribe to the channel to support our work and not miss the upcoming videos. In 1936, in the necropolis of Saqqara, inside the tomb of Prince Sabu, son of Yafero Ajweeb, a mysterious object was discovered. British archaeologist Walter Brian Emery, a meticulous First Dynasty scholar, discovered it. And when he saw it for the first time, he was puzzled. It was unlike the other funerary objects found in that ancient sand. It had no inscriptions, no divine figures, no apparent symbolic value. It was just a disc, a disc made of schist, a fragile stone, unable to bear stress, yet carved with perfect curves and even thicknesses that today would need computer numerical control machines. Its surface is smooth, the blade profile is regular, and the central hub with the through hole shows a precision that doesn't fit the technical context of that era. Egyptologists recorded it as a schist bowl, a cautious definition, almost an elegant way of saying, we don't know what it is. Yet the shape contradicts every attempt to explain it as a simple ornamental object. It's too thin to hold anything, too fragile to cover, too technical to be symbolic. Every detail suggests a function, but what function? To understand, start with the material. The schist, the stone it was made from, can't rotate or withstand stress. Any mechanical use, like a propeller rotor or wheel, would have broken it immediately. The disc of Sabu wasn't likely an operational component. Similarly, it doesn't show any traces of burning, wear, or organic residue. It wasn't a lamp, it wasn't a container, it wasn't a sacrificial object. The most obvious hypotheses have been ruled out. Only two remain. That Sabu's disc was a symbolic representation of something real, or a study model, a prototype of a larger and functional object. The perspective completely shifts here. Because if you look at it not as a ritual artifact, but as a project, everything looks different. The three blades might not be an aesthetic motif, but a technical design. The same logic used today to build impellers, fans, or rotors. And yet here we encounter the paradox. Schist, a beautiful material to carve, but completely unsuitable for withstanding movement or pressure. Any attempt to make it rotate would destroy it. So the disc of Sabu couldn't have been used to generate rotation, nor to move air or water. But if the material was carefully chosen and the shape is not random, then the schist must have offered something else, something that no metal could have provided. And here, an almost forgotten detail comes into play. When struck or stimulated, schist vibrates. Yes, it's fragile, but it's extremely resonant. It produces clear and deep sound waves. Maybe the fragility of schist wasn't a limitation, but a choice. So the disc might not have been meant to move, but to resonate. From here, a bolder and more coherent hypothesis emerges. The disc of Sabu wasn't a movement-generating machine, but a tool for understanding vibration. Now let's imagine that disc with its harmonic shape, the three thin blades, and the central hole being struck or traversed by a sound wave. The energy wouldn't dissipate, but would form regular patterns. Similar to cymatics, the science studying sound shapes, the vibrations would generate geometric patterns, spirals, symmetries, and the object would become a natural amplifier of frequencies. 
And if it had been a model, it could have represented the shape of a principle, not of a machine. In fact, the Egyptians had a much deeper relationship with sound and vibration than we imagine. In their worldview, sound was not just a simple physical phenomenon, but a cosmic force. It was the very substance of creation. In sacred texts, Ta creates the universe by speaking. The divine word doesn't describe the world, it creates it. Sound is therefore an ordering power, a primordial vibration capable of transforming energy into matter. For them, the voice was creative and matter responded to its vibration. And if we look at their works with this perspective, many enigmas that seem unsolvable begin to make sense. Perhaps the Egyptians built not just to worship gods, but to recreate the original principle, the vibration shaping reality. What if Sabu's disc was a small resonating machine? Could their largest constructions, the pyramids, the temples, the sarcophagi, have been instruments of the same language? Designs conceived not only to last, but to vibrate. Let's think about the sarcophagi of Saqqara. They are enormous blocks of granite, polished on the inside with a precision of a tenth of a millimeter, while the outside remains rough, almost unfinished. An apparent contradiction, but perfectly consistent. If the function was acoustic, the smooth interior serves to let the sound waves flow like in a resonance chamber. The rough exterior insulates the sound and prevents it from dispersing. Their arrangement, seen from above, seems anything but random. Aligned in rows with precise orientation, they resemble a trumpet or acoustic channel. And so maybe they weren't tombs, but instruments for amplifying sound and energy. And we find this same logic on a monumental scale in the Great Pyramid of Giza, its internal galleries, the King's Chamber and the Queen's Chamber. The mysterious shafts that point toward the stars don't seem to be arranged for religious reasons, but for geometric ones. They could be aligned like sound cavities with dimensions that follow harmonic ratios. The King's Chamber in particular, built entirely of granite, produces a natural resonance at about 440 hertz. Some researchers hypothesize that in its original form, it might have vibrated slightly lower, around 432 Abichi, a frequency that many traditions consider more harmonious with the natural resonances of the earth. Maybe all this is just a coincidence, or maybe it's a clue to a forgotten knowledge of fundamental frequencies. This would explain both the odd shafts and tunnels in the pyramid and the choice of material. If we view it this way, Egypt doesn't seem like a stone kingdom, but like a giant instrument designed to communicate with Earth. And if all this were true, then the discovery of Sabu's disc would be just a clue to a greater technology. It's like an archaeologist 20,000 years from now discovering a small combustion engine fossil. He might see it as a symbol, a container, or even an amulet. But a more attentive eye, observing that perfect cavity, that inner chamber, might realize that it was the heart of a larger mechanism a combustion chamber, and that our civilization somehow used fire as a source of energy. From that small clue, he would rebuild a whole lost world. We could apply this same logic to the Sabu disk, a small fragile object, but one that contains the principle of a forgotten technology, not based on combustion, but on the harmonic vibration of matter. And this mysterious disk is not an isolated case. At various Egyptian sites, other objects and symbols appear to convey the same message. The Cairo Museum holds stone and copper discs with central holes and polished, often radially engraved surfaces. Officially, they're called amulets or decorations, but their proportions resemble the resonating plates used in labs today to visualize sound waves. At Dendera's Temple of Hathor, the famous Dendera lamps depict figures holding vials emitting wavy lines resembling discharges or vibrations. Their meaning has been debated for centuries. If interpreted acoustically instead of electrically, those waves represent sound, energy that propagates and vibrates like light. 
Some carvings in the Temple of Edfu depict priests beside concentric discs and cogwheels etched in stone. The inscriptions describe these spaces as houses of sound, places where the voice of the gods was reproduced. Perhaps not just a simple ritual reference, but a technical description of resonant chambers. Even minor household items follow the same logic. Diorite and basalt cups with perfectly calibrated central holes, musical instruments like bronze sistrums capable of producing precise and constant frequencies, and even the decorative motifs of the temples, spirals, waves, vortices, seem to want to graphically translate an acoustic principle. Maybe the Egyptians knew a language of matter based not on mechanics, but on resonance. A knowledge in which frequency was the key to universal harmony, and understanding that key meant communicating with nature itself. The disc of Sabu, fragile and perfect, could then represent the symbol of a greater principle, a silent trace of knowledge we've never fully understood. Maybe that civilization sensed these laws by watching nature and shaping architecture to its rhythms. Or, more unsettling, perhaps they learned them from someone else. From an older culture, from a forgotten knowledge, from teachers of whom nothing remains. Confirmation that we might be on the right track comes from the analysis of many texts from ancient Egypt, where clues emerge that seem to speak about it in a surprising way. In the Shabaka text, one of the oldest inscriptions of Memphite theology, it says Ta, the craftsman god, built the world not with his hands, but with his heart and tongue. It is through the heart and the tongue that Ta gave life to all the gods. Here sound is the essence of creation. Words don't describe the world, they create it. This concept appears in more concrete forms in the ritual papyri. In the temple ceremonies, the priests would recite formulas to open the mouths of the divine statues, allowing the deity to breathe and communicate. With my voice I open God's mouth and his breath fills it. A symbolic gesture, but one that reveals a precise belief. That sound could animate stone, make it alive, restore its energy, that the voice was a means to transfer vital force to matter. And again, if we look at Greek accounts, the suggestion comes up again. Diodorus Siculus in the first century before Christ. He says the Egyptians used lost tools to raise stones and their buildings were possible only because of a science that died with them. He discusses tools and lost knowledge from centuries ago, not magic. Later, in hermetic texts attributed to Thoth or Hermes Trismegistus, the world is described as an eternal music and human knowledge as the ability to tune into the vibration of everything. Words reflecting the ancient Memphite idea, vibration as a universal law and sound connecting spirit and matter. It's clear that the Egyptians attributed a physical and creative power to sound, considering it a real force capable of changing the state of matter. And if those rituals were the spiritual version of a physical principle, then we can imagine that behind the mythology there was hidden experimental knowledge, a way of interacting with energy through form and frequency. Today we might call it acoustics or the physics of vibrations. For them, it was simply the voice of the gods. And maybe, as the myths suggest, that voice was not invented by the Egyptians, but learned from someone who already knew it. Echoes of an older civilization survive only in stone. But what is shocking today is that we find all this in the very recent revelations of quantum physics, which show us how everything, in the end, it's nothing but vibration, frequency taking shape, and matter responding to energy. Sabu's disk could therefore be the echo of a lost knowledge, a reminder that reality is always moving and vibrating. Even what we believe to be immobile, and that perhaps we haven't invented anything, but we're just rediscovering it. At this point, we're really curious to know your opinion. Let us know in the comments what you think. And if you like the video, remember to subscribe to the channel, leave a like, and share it. It's the most concrete way to help us continue our research and tell you new stories. See you in the next story.